Please join me in the call to worship. We are a justice-making, truth-seeking people. We gather as a community of believers and seekers. We share a reverence for the mystery of life. We are building the beloved community. Come, let us worship together. Good morning, Birmingham Unitarian Church. Good morning. It is good to be together again. Whether you are joining us here in the sanctuary, remotely via Zoom, or watching this recording later, it is good to connect with you. As a multi-platform church, it is important for us to build a bridge between online and in-person participants. We call this connection opportunity greeting our virtual neighbors. First, we will project the image of folks who are currently on Zoom up here on our screen and ask them to turn their cameras on and give us a wave. Now, we who are gathered in person will turn to face the camera in the back of the sanctuary and give them a wave. Whenever and however we connect with BUC, we are building BUC. At home, on campus, in the world, every day, we are Birmingham Unitarian Church, and we are building the beloved community. Now we join with other Unitarian Universalists around the world as we light our chalice. We light this chalice to honor the memory of those who have come before us kindling flames of wisdom in dark times, willing to challenge orthodoxy even at great personal risk, giving us a legacy of freedom and a love of truth, a legacy that warms our hearts and lights our paths. All right, everyone, um, please rise as you're willing or able to sing our first hymn, which is number 175 in the gray hymnal, We Celebrate the Web of Life.
The mission of Birmingham Unitarian Church is to be a free and welcoming religious community that encourages lives of integrity, learning, service, and joy. One way we live out this mission is by giving half of our weekly offering to a nonprofit organization that shares our values and addresses needs in one of these areas, environmental action, economic justice, civic engagement, and racial justice. We support a new organization each month. The recipient of our plate sharing from July 16th through August 20th is the Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence. Progress has been made in Michigan with the passage of universal background checks, safe storage laws, and red flag laws, and there's much more to do. The Michigan Coalition to Prevent Gun Violence continues its work on evidence-based policies and community education in support of further actions to address the epidemic of gun violence in our state and nationally. In 2018, BUC passed a resolution affirming the need for changes in law and society to address this issue. And our support for the coalition's work is in keeping with this resolution. Every dollar of support can help to save lives. Let there be an offering in support of our beloved community and organizations that build the world we dream about. This morning's offering will now be received with gratitude. Ushers, please come forward. We are a church of open minds, loving hearts, and helping hands. With gratitude, we dedicate this offering to the good works of our congregation and dedicate ourselves to its service. Each Sunday, we make space in our worship to list the joys and sorrows that have been written either on the internet for our perusal or here in the book at the back of the hall. I remind uh, you that uh, Joanne Scouten, uh, Scouten uh, had, a, had a, a grief that was so uh, named last week. It's that her sister, Janet, died suddenly of ovarian cancer. So when you see Joanne, please uh, make note of that. And Mary Dunn brings us a joy. 
Mary writes that thanks to the generosity of BUC members and friends, a total of 225 hygiene and snack combinations were delivered to Knight of Angels of Detroit, an organization that advocates for trafficked individuals. Bulk supplies of toothpaste, soap, and other supplies were donated as well. So, writes Mary, thank you, BUC. And now may we take a moment together thinking about our own lives and the life of our community and our nation. We know that joys and sorrows are simply parts of human life. It is our hope that we experience more on the side of joy than we do of sorrow. But being aware of that duality is a necessary part of how we mature and how we respond to life whatever life brings our way. And we learn strategies for dealing both with joys and sorrows. Strategies that we find in community, strategies we find in worship. May we think on these things in silence. This Sunday's first reading is a condensed version of an article from the Boston's Women's History Trail, written by Bonnie Heard Smith. Lucy Stone was born on Coys Hill in rural West Brookfield, Massachusetts. The family was dominated by a father who believed in male superiority, including in the household. Lucy's mother, who worked tirelessly to maintain the family farm, received little help. Lucy was not encouraged towards education and certainly not towards college. Still, she was determined to go and she secured a teaching position for herself at the age of 16. 
After about nine years, Lucy had earned enough money to attend Oberlin College in Ohio, the first college to allow men and women to study together. As Lucy's daughter, Alice Stone Blackwell later explained, at the low wages then paid to women, it took Lucy nine years to save up enough money to enter college. There was no difficulty as to choice of an alma mater. There was only one college that admitted women. At Oberlin, Lucy discovered her talent for public speaking. However, the debating society was only open to men. Women were expected to sit in the audience. Lucy persuaded one professor to tutor her and another student in one successful oratory presentation. But the college squashed the activity. The women met in secret and continued to practice their public speaking skills. Lucy Stone's talent as a writer was recognized by the college, however, and she was asked to compose a commencement address for her 1847 graduation ceremony. When she learned that a man would deliver her speech, she refused to comply. Years later, in 1883, when Oberlin College celebrated its 50th anniversary, officials invited Lucy Stone to return and give her own speech, which she did. At Oberlin, Lucy Stone encountered William Lloyd Garrison and became actively involved in the abolitionist movement. The American Anti-Slavery Society hired her as a public speaker. Lucy Stone was one of the first women to step out of the traditional behind the scenes women's sphere and take to the public stage. She lectured on both abolitionism and women's rights. Though she faced verbal abuse and physical attack, she kept on. Lucy Stone was not part of the first women's rights convention that took place in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, but she was instrumental in organizing the first national women's rights convention in Worcester, Massachusetts, which drew more than a thousand people who were to consider the great question of women's rights, duties, and relations, and the men and women of our country who feel sufficient interest in the subject to give an earnest, earnest thought and effective effort to its rightful adjustment. The convention elected officers who were appointed to committees on education, civil and political rights, social relations, and advocations. Its final resolution, which called for equality before the law without distinction of sex or color, was highly controversial because of its shocking support towards equality for black women. The convention was applauded by a few local and national newspapers, but disparaged by most of them. The issues raised at the convention, however, were heard throughout the world. It became a touchstone for international feminism, inspiring coverage and essays in France, England, and Germany. Lucy Stone continued to speak and tour the country to address women's rights and abolition and speak to legislators. In 1851, she addressed the Massachusetts legislator at the State House, asking them to give full civil rights to women under the state constitution. That day, she met Henry Brown Blackwell, whom she would eventually marry after a two-year courtship during which Harry promised to protect restrictive marriage laws. Oh, protest restrictive marriage laws. <laughs> <laughs> Their vows included a statement refusing to adhere to a law that refused to recognize the wife as an independent, rational being. They omitted the word obey from the vows, and Lucy kept her own name, hereafter referring to herself as Mrs. Lucy Stone. From then on, other women who kept their names were referred to as Lucy Stoners. In 1857, Lucy gave birth to Alice Stone Blackwell, her only child. Shortly thereafter, she refused to pay her property tax bill on the grounds that she was not fairly represented. Sir, Enclosed, I return my tax bill without paying it. She wrote to the tax collector in a letter that was published in the Orange Journal, a local newspaper. My reason for not doing so is women suffer taxation and yet have no representation, which is not only unjust to one half of the adult population, but is contrary to our theory of government. Years later in 1873, her friend, with her friend Julia Ward Howe, Lucy Stone organized the New England Women's Tea Party at Faneuil Hall, 
where women protested taxation without representation in a very public forum. Lucy devoted much of her energy during the Civil War to the Union side and the end of slavery. After the war, when Congress passed the 14th Amendment guaranteeing equal protection under the law to former male slaves, suffragists were dismayed to have the word male included in the Constitution. Under the 15th Amendment, African American men would have the right to vote. This time, the suffrage movement suffered a terrible schism. Lucy Stone, Julia Ward Howe, and others agreed with the African American rights crusader Frederick Douglass that the 15th Amendment had a better chance of passing as is, and that for black men this was literally a matter of life and death. This group believed women's suffrage was better handled at the state level, persuading state by state until a majority would prevail. Other suffragists like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony disagreed and held fast to the call for national women's suffrage. They formed the National Women's Suffrage Association in New York. In Boston, Lucy Stone and others founded the American Women's Suffrage Association and began to publish the Women's Journal out of their office. It wasn't until 20 years later, thanks to Alice Stone Blackwell, that the two sides were united as the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Even in death, Lucy Stone was a first. By her own design, she had six men and six women as pallbearers. She also was the first person in Massachusetts to be cremated. Unfortunately, Forest Hill Cemetery, where she is buried, did not respect her last wishes, and they used the last name Blackwell on her stone. Lucy Stone did not live to see women achieve the right to vote, but the role she played toward that 1920 achievement was pivotal. For her unwavering drive and inspiring presence, her suffrage colleagues called her their morning star. Well, thank you, Colin. The second reading is a poem I introduced one month ago from this platform. It's by William Butler Yeats, and it's entitled, The Second Coming. Now you all are familiar with the first coming, are you not? It's about what? The what? The virgin birth. We Unitarians have a difficult time with that. <laughs> Yeats wrote this poem right after the Second World War had, uh, I'm sorry, the First World War had ended, and he grieved about the number of people who were killed and wounded on both sides in that war. Now, he goes through the first eight lines that I introduced you to last month, and then he gets into what he actually is suggesting by the second coming. And I will tell you in advance that for him, the second coming is the apocalypse, which is essentially the end of the world. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction. The worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand. Surely the second coming is at hand. 
the second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of spiritus mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in the sands of the desert, a shape with a lion body and the head of a lamb, a man is the figure is moving its slow thighs while all about it real shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again, but now I know that 20 centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast its hour come round at last slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. Well, you and I are told and told again, we live in an age of anxiety. Indeed, we hear it so often that I think someone who lives a happy life should feel guilty hearing those words of the age of anxiety and wonder why she has been so blessed with happiness. Well, think of the linear diagram with worry at the west end and anxiety in the middle and depression on the far east side of that diagram. Now, I'm not going to cover depression. I have never fallen into it, as far as I know. (laughs) And that might make me a very lucky person who escaped suffering from a mental condition. The only acknowledgement I'll give to depression is to recommend that you pick out this most recent edition of Time magazine. On the cover is a photograph of Senator John Fetterman. 
The title of the cover is Out of Darkness. And then it goes on to say, the untold story of Senator John Fetterman's battle with depression. I think if you look at that, you will learn a lot about uh, the senator, but you will learn also a lot about depression. So let's consider then worry and anxiety. What is anxiety and what causes it? Well, genetics can have something to do with those who suffer from anxiety, as might the chemistry of the brain. Or some people who have anxious and serious medical conditions can be so anxious about being anxious then they remain patients the rest of their lives. The anxious among us, as part of health anxiety, fear unfounded events, such as the fear of flying, or even the fear of socializing. And yes, it is possible for a person with a serious and continuing medical condition to suffer from anxiety the rest of his life. But we need only read statistics captured by the Mental Health Foundation's report of 2013 to get some idea of the extent of anxiety in our own country. 10 years ago, those statistics indicated that there were 8.2 million cases of anxiety disorder. So not just commonplace anxiety, but an anxiety disorder that were reported in the prior year. Putting it differently and up to date, one in four Americans, one in four, have symptoms of anxiety. Now that percentage is a significant increase from a 2019 survey that found only 8% of American adults with anxiety indicators. Now I recognize that these statements and percentages are subject to many variables and imprecise data collection but we can all have some understanding of key changes in contemporary society. Since 2019, what have we found as stressors? Well, there was and is COVID. There was and is the war in Ukraine. There was and is global warming, record-breaking heat, water shortages, water inundations, large-scale stressors, all. And many of you can add to that list very personal or family changes that cause stress. But we need to separate worry from anxiety. The definitions are quite simple. Anxiety occurs when a person's levels of stress are so high and on a continuing basis that those stress levels negatively affect performance and ability to carry out day-by-day -day activities. Anxiety happens when a body reacts to fear and kicks into a flight or fight mode of concern. It's a perfectly normal reaction to threat, whether real or not. Lesser fears are worries. 
and worries are not as debilitating as our anxieties. Now a teacher may tell his wife while at breakfast that he worries about Jean because she had a bad headache the previous day. He says, if she is not in class today, I'll call her mother. Well, clearly he's worrying. But his day will proceed with few bumps in the road. Now let's take it up a notch. When the teacher returned home last night, he was really upset to his wife. He said, a terrible thing happened today in class. I was talking about geography and Jean got out of her chair but tripped on the leg of her desk and fell. Her head was bleeding. And I called downstairs to ask for medical help quickly. Well, the ambulance staff came and Jean was still on the floor. And the other kids were finally completely quiet as the paramedics took Jean out. I just can't stop worrying about her, her trauma, and that of her parents. Now in this scenario, the teacher used the word worrying but his concern was at the level of anxiety. When he returns to that classroom, his ability to carry out his day-to-day -day activities may and probably will be negatively affected. Well, a few additional examples of worrying. The English teacher thinks, have I found good examples of metaphor for today? The driver thinks, oh, I'm going 10 miles per hour over the speed limit. I wonder if that's going to be a problem. The young plumber thinks, I'm uh, on my own. Uh, no longer an intern. I sure hope I don't screw up today. Or an example from a text you may have read. I know you don't read it often, but it's called the Bible. In Proverbs chapter 30, one reads an example of anxiety. You know, the writer begins in sort of a prayer-like request for his God's help. But then it changes to threats if he does not get his way. So here he is talking to his God in Proverbs 30. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that I need, or I shall be full and deny you. And I'll say, who is the Lord? Or I shall be poor and still and profane the name of my God. Change can be a basis for anxiety. We're in a strange situation nationally when 30% or more of a political party denies what they themselves saw, a failed rebellion. They saw it again and again on their home televisions and yet deny that it was a rebellion. And I think it largely the fear that this country and probably the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Large numbers of people long for simpler times. 
in retrospect, more laid back, gentler, family-oriented days when families knew everyone else on their blocks. If only time could slow down and we could go back to the good old days, we'd be so much better off. We can never call, <laughs> never turn the clock back. It's always going to keep ticking ahead. And so we have to adjust and do what we can to make it the best set of changes possible. Well, I was talking not too long ago with a man who does not understand the LGBTQ community. In fact, this is what he said to me. Well, how is this country going to go on with men marrying men and women marrying women? The population's going to go down because those people will not have babies. We're not going to have a large enough population to keep everything going. Well, I was taken aback by that line of reasoning. I said, look, Charlie, human nature is just the same now as it was thousands of years ago. Just the same. There have always been men who are attracted to other men and women attracted to other women. But in the past, they might have remained single or found themselves in a bad marriage. And the same with men attracted to other men. There are lots of stories about sex people fearing for their lives because of whom they loved. Now, a days, people in that community are asserting rights. But I don't think their percentage is any different than it was a thousand years ago. It's just a matter of human rights. Charlie, my feeling is we should just go with love wherever it may be found. And Charlie said, oh. Now in the end, anxiety is always around the corner waiting for us to slip on the banana peel. Change has always been there in social life, but it has not been moving as quickly as it does now. Think of technology. The atomic bomb, for example, was built during, during the Second World War it had to be modeled on platforms that could resolve mathematical problems more quickly than humans could. The computer, if you want to call it that, that they used was based on vacuum tubes that filled a large room in the scientist's lab. Now, in fact, the first two TVs that Diane and I bought were ran on vacuum tubes. Uh, they did not last long. And what a joyful day it was when we bought TV number three, and number three had no vacuum tubes. Now, computers have given us doors that open to all kinds of information. If, for example, pre-computer, I wanted to know something about a poet, I went to the university library, thumbed through a card catalog, jotted down some information, and then went into the stacks to find books on the subject of concern. Now, of course, of the two books that I needed, 
in order to get some background information. One was out, and no one knew when, for certain when it would be returned. And now, if I want some information on a novelist or something she herself has published, I sit at my desk, open the PC, type in a topic, and miraculously, information comes up on the screen. Just like that. For those of us who were born before computers, such change is magic as well as a time saver. And all of you have examples of how your lives have been changed by modern technology. Modern medicine. Or the need to transfer from gas motors to battery motors. All your imag your imag let your imagination run freely back to the 1700s, the start of the Industrial Revolution. What a change it is to go from weaving on a loom in the house to larger, faster looms in a mill. And then think of the change from horse-pulled wagons to the Model T. Now in my time, I lived on a farm without a telephone, a condition that lasted until I turned 13. We have gone from pens and yellow pads to typewriters and then to computers and printers. And now, so much more quickly than I thought possible, there is, God help us, AI. Artificial intelligence with possibilities of so much good and so many problems. If we do not create boundaries that set limits on what it cannot do. You know, another fear is a career loss, especially for white collar people. And yet our unemployment rate is nearly 3%, of which that is considered nearly full employment. So with all of the changes that have come to us to date, rapidly and deeply, we still have essentially full employment. Now we don't know what's going to happen with AI. And so comes the great fear that, oh my God, I'll be laid off. They won't need me any longer. I don't have much money in the bank. Investments are losing money. What's going to happen to me? That's, a, that's what it comes down to, isn't it? What's going to happen to me and my family? But we don't know. We do not know what that effect of AI is going to be. Well, certainly there are other issues that bother hearts and bother emotions, but there is also help. If one is anxious, that person should find a listening ear. That's a good starting point. And if such talk does not help, then professional help is available, perhaps from a therapist, a psychologist, a psychiatrist, a medical doctor, possibly even a member of the clergy. Now there is a short poem by Mary Oliver that presents a very different vision than does the vision of Yeats in the Second Coming. This is a vision of wealth in nature. So here, as we close the morning of worship, I want to let you know about Mary Oliver's The World. 
I would like to write a poem about the world that has in it nothing fancy. But it seems impossible. Whatever the subject, the morning sun glimmers it. The tulip feels the heat and flaps its petals open and becomes a star. The ants bore into the peony bud and there is a dark pinprick with a swell of sweetness. Now as for the stones on the beach, <laughs> forget it. Each one could, could be set in gold. So I tried with my eyes shut. <laughs> and of course, the birds were singing. And the aspen trees were shaking the sweetest music out of their leaves. And that was followed by, guess what? A momentous and beautiful silence as comes to all of us in little earfuls if we're not too hurried to hear it. Now as for spiders, oh how the dew hangs in their webs even if they say nothing or seem to say nothing. So Fancy is the world. Who knows? Maybe they sing. So fancy is the world. Who knows? Maybe, maybe the stars do too. And the ants and the peonies and the warm stones so happy to be where they are on the beach, listening of being locked up in gold. What a world is the natural. May it be a source of healing in our time, in our space. May it be a source of healing in our time of anxiety. May it be. And please rise as you're willing and able to sing our final hymn, which is number 108, My Life Flows On in Endless Song from the Gray Hymnal. My life flows on in endless song above this lamentation. I hear the 
Go now into this world as a beacon of hope and joy. Go in love, go in peace. Now that our worship has ended, our service begins. May it be so. Amen and blessed be.